murder. Once a fortnight at Melbourne in Derbyshire, an elderly woman visits the graveyard where her granddaughter was buried. And from the back room of a terraced house, she spent 13 years lobbying people in authority. Dear Mr Knowing, I do not know how much you know of the murder of my granddaughter Lynn Siddons, who was murdered April the 3rd, 1978, and my family and myself have been fighting to get the killer to justice. Flo Siddons believes if she doesn't fight for justice, her granddaughter's death will be forgotten. Flo and Lynn Siddons had a special relationship. Flo raised her from a baby. Mrs Siddons had already brought up four children at Sinfin in Derby. In 1961, one of her daughters was 16 and in trouble. I was six months pregnant before my mum asked me if I was. And then, of course, I had to tell her and I had to go to the dots and that. But I never told my dad. My mum told me dad and... He was really upset about it. He didn't speak to me again till after I had Lynn. When we was going to have her adopted, we thought it was a shame like I said I'd bring her up and that. And that's when we took her when she was six weeks old, we decided not to let her go. I was still living at home anyway, and it just became a natural thing that when Lynn started talking, she just called my mum, mum. And it just went on from there, really. And she, with me still living there, she called me Gail. She used to get off the, the school bus and come to my parents' house. And we had a family pet dog called Flash. And he used to take her from our house over to over the bridge in Sim, to Simfin to her house every evening. It got to be a ritual every evening. And that was because... Um, he was a friendly dog anyway, and she had a pet, so she got on with dogs as well. And um, she used to call for me in the mornings as well, going to school. And we'd get the bus from Mamba Corner from where I lived. And she'd bring three biscuits, one for me, one for Flash, and one for herself. She had a wonderful record collection, actually, of 50 and 60s. And um, we used to go around and we used to pretend that we were sort of like the pop stars and stand there and, and sing, which was wonderful, really. In April 1978, when Lynn was 16, she went shopping and didn't come back. Her family began to worry and started knocking on neighbours' doors. A few houses up the street lived a family called Brooks. Lynn was friendly with 15-year-old Roy Brooks. He said they'd gone looking for a job, then separated. Anyway, 10 o'clock come, one policeman come down and he said, well, we can't look for it tonight because it's too dark and too frosty and that. Well, he went away and then we phoned my sons then to come. And uh, I was getting worried because I knew something had happened. I just felt it in my bones, it had. And that night when she was missing, the wind was blowing and two o'clock in the morning, uh, Keith and Barry went looking round the woods. That's because if she's in them woods, she'd never survive the morning because it was that cold. The police treated it as a missing person case. Most missing persons turn up unharmed. Lynn's family weren't impressed. We knew something had happened. We didn't know what. I don't think you like to admit it to yourself. But um, they wouldn't listen to us. They kept saying that she'd run away. I would say that from the time that I first met Mrs Siddons, she quickly convinced me that uh, everything wasn't well. And I certainly treated the matter seriously, along with the other police officers. Every day when we went to the police station, they just didn't seem to be interested and we weren't getting no publicity, so in the end we went to see if we could get something further done. So what did you do? I uh, went to see Philip Whitehead, who was my MP. My mum went with me and as soon as he heard of it, he was, you know, outraged that there'd been no publicity or anything, being as she'd been missing nearly a week. And uh, the next day we got full publicity. Well, Evening Telegraph and put out on the news at the Derby County Football Ground. I'm afraid the police response when the girl was still missing, although as we now know, dead by that time, 
was that she was probably sleeping rough and uh, girls often did that and we weren't to be worried. Well, everyone was worried. The whole neighbourhood was out looking for her. There were appeals uh, made at the, uh, the football ground, at the baseball ground for her to the, the crowds. There were general, there was general agitation and she was found horribly murdered soon afterwards. I never forgot, though, that initial indifference and the sort of shrug, oh, she's, uh, she's just off sleeping rough. Six days after Lynn disappeared, the awful truth emerged. Two boys out walking by the Trent and Mersey Canal, a mile or so from her home, found her body. There were 40 knife wounds, and so it appeared that Lynn had been stabbed to death. Now a missing person case became a murder case with an obvious suspect. Roy Brooks was arrested and taken in for questioning. By the early hours of the following morning, he'd confessed. He said Lynn made sexual advances towards him, so he stabbed her. But his stepfather, Michael Brooks, later named as the probable killer, was allowed to see him before the statement was made. There's been doubt about it ever since. He was allowed to speak to his stepfather, but there was certainly a policeman present. Do you remember who that was? I wouldn't, I can't remember now, no. Right. Looking back, do you think it was the right thing for him to have been allowed to see his stepfather, given what's happened since? Um, if, I don't think, I don't think uh, it would have made any difference to the outcome at all. Why not? Um, I was quite satisfied that the that, that Roy uh, made his initial admission without any sort of pressure, uh, and at, at that stage I accepted um, Roy's version. But the pathologist Alan Usher gave a different cause of death to that contained in Roy Brooks' confession. Professor Usher said Lynn had been strangled. Roy Brooks was held in Leicester Prison. And because he'd been charged, detectives couldn't routinely question him. Dr. Tom Dorman, a psychiatrist, saw the boy a number of times. His patient gave a new version of what had happened. The police were called. The story that he gave later on at the Crown Court at Nottingham was the one that he gave that morning. That his stepfather had been involved in the, in the murder. And uh, the statement was made through his solicitor. When you heard him make that admission, what, what were your immediate feelings? Can you remember? I was um, quite surprised. Why? Because it had been entirely unexpected. As well as being surprised, did you believe him at that point? Or, or not? Um, I'm not. I'm, I'm not prefer to say whether I believed him or not. I wasn't, I wasn't given the opportunity to question him on that second statement. And at that stage, now there was any other police officer. When Roy Brooks made the second statement, I think they should have held the trial up then and gone into it more then, in investigations. But they didn't do that. They just took the two statements into court, which I thought was wrong. On the 6th of November 1978, at the Old Crown Court in Nottingham, Roy Brooks went on trial accused of murder. He repeated what he'd said in prison. He said his stepfather, Michael Brooks, had given him a knife and ordered him to stab Lynn. He claimed he'd only scratched her body and it was his stepfather who'd carried out the killing. His lawyers made much of the fact that though Lynn was four inches taller and a stone heavier than Roy, she didn't appear to have put up a struggle. The judge, Mr Justice Mays, reminded the jury repeatedly that they weren't there to try the stepfather, they were there to try the boy, and they should concern themselves only with whether the boy had murdered Lynn Siddons. They took just an hour to return their verdict. Not guilty. Roy's acquittal was reported only in the local press. He was taken into care at the Pastures Psychiatric Hospital. While in care, he was interviewed by a senior detective, Superintendent Jim Reddington. The police had to find out which of Roy's two statements was the truth. His social worker, Keith Sherwood, sat in on the questioning. He said it was his impression the police wanted Roy to revert to the first statement. He did. 
Superintendent Reddington, it was suggested that you wanted Roy Brooks to implicate himself alone so that the case could be closed and you could get the Siddons family off your back. What do you say to that? That's entirely wrong. The only, my only objective, as it is in all the case I investigate, is to find the truth of the matter. That's all I want to do, find the truth of the matter. And if one was involved alone or both, all I want to do is get the truth. The victim's family demonstrated outside Derby Police Station and marched through the streets, claiming the case had been quietly closed. We did the demonstration in 1979, got 6,000 signatures, and then we started putting posters up in cars, going round who murdered Lynn Siddons. The other one, we put posters up all round town who murdered Lynn Siddons, because I was threatened with going to court for that. The case was beginning to attract attention. The BBC broadcast a documentary within months of the end of the trial, with Auntie Cynthia on the offensive. We are dissatisfied with the handling of the case by Derbyshire Constabulary, and disturbed that at this late day the murderer is still at large. We are therefore seeking assurance that the police are still pursuing inquiries and that the case will be speedily concluded. The Brooks family was rehoused because with all the publicity, life in Sinfin had become unbearable. The council moved them to an address several miles away. But even there, Michael Brooks and his wife Dot were made to feel unwelcome. It had been that way since Lynn was murdered. Roughly a week after Roy was, uh, my stepson was arrested and charged with the crime. The little girl who, who was age seven, Tracy, she was uh, beaten up, um, we had bricks thrown at the door, anonymous letters. Um, on one occasion, there was three lads aged about 11 to 12 that tried to strangle her. And through the good nature of um, the next door neighbour at that time, actually seen this being taken place, and she chased the lads. Otherwise, I think my daughter had been dead. Were you involved in the attack on Lynn Sittons? No, I was not. In any way? No. Do you think that people still believe, despite the verdict of the trial, that you were involved? Quite a few people, yes. I would definitely say so. Um, <coughs> I've not really moved since we've left Simpkin. I've not really moved out of my home. I've always stayed in the Derby area. But um, friends of the family, and even my mother, has come down here to visit me at my address and told me she's heard people still trying to make an accusation against me. The next year, Michael Brooks left his wife for another woman and Dot Brooks got in touch with the Siddons family. She said he'd confessed to killing Lynn. She kept phoning me up every night and telling me what was done to Lynn and what was said while it was being done and all different things and what Lynn had on and she kept going through the gory details all the while. And I kept saying to her, well, if he comes back, would you retract the statement? She says, no. She says, I, I, you know, I don't want him back and what have you. Dot Brooks made two statements about Michael, that he'd used a knife on her while having sex and that he'd boasted of murdering Lynn. But when Mick Brooks came back, she retracted the statement and no charges were made for him for wasting police's time and the statement was just dropped. Cynthia Smith then took the law into her own hands. Seeing Michael and Dot Brooks together in the street, she drove her car at them. She was fined a hundred pounds for reckless driving. At one point, she says, there was talk of an attempted murder charge. The Brooks family, now including Roy, decided to start a new life in Peterborough. They found a house on the Westwood estate. The existing tenant wanted to move back to Derby. Over a drink, he agreed a swap. While in the pub, he says he became curious about the Lynn Siddons case. And after three or four pints, he, you know, he, he went to the toilet and I asked his young lad about the case with the Lynn Siddons, you know, affair. And uh, he, t he told me that uh, he, it was his stepfather, you know, because I asked him straight, straight out, you know, about it. And he said it was his stepfather. He said, but don't tell him, you know, don't, don't mention that I've told you. This is what the words he said. 
And uh, a couple of pints later, when he came back, uh, you know, I asked his dad out as well, straight up. I had a bit. Michael Brooks? Yeah, Michael Brooks, yeah. And uh, he said yes. He said, but they'll never get me. The police couldn't follow up Shane Morley's allegation because he didn't tell them till five years later. By then, Lynn's family had long since put their faith in the media rather than the police. In 1981, they found a new and influential ally, Britain's best-known campaigning journalist, Paul Foote. Mrs Siddons came and we had a long chat and I was very impressed with her. And, of course, when I read the papers, I was absolutely amazed by the story and was determined that something should be written about it. I did write an article that was actually chucked out by the lawyers because it, it, they said that it's absolutely impossible. You can't write an article which suggests, uh, however, in however far off a way, but nevertheless suggests that a chap is a murderer uh, who hasn't been charged for the murder. You can't, you can't say that kind of thing. You have to produce more proof. In 1981, after lengthy legal debate, Paul Foote's arguments won the day. Of course, when it was published, there was no complaint from anyone at all. In fact, the problem about it was that there was, there was no complaint and, and no interest, as far as I could see. And that's why, in one way or another, for ten years, I have kept going back to it, repeating it and going back to it. While Paul Foote kept writing, Lynn's family kept up the pressure on the police. In 1985, they filed a complaint. Merseyside detectives investigated and produced a report. Derbyshire's police committee was given that report. It wasn't made public. The senior police officers that were conducting this inquiry for Liverpool were absolutely shocked about what they discovered in Derbyshire. They were absolutely outraged that uh, their recommendation that there should be another inquiry by outside police force into what had happened here was turned down effectively by the Derbyshire police and therefore couldn't be pursued by the DPP. A new solicitor began acting for the Siddons family. She told them they were wasting their time trying to get a prosecution for murder. They didn't have the money to bring a private prosecution. The police and the DPP didn't have the evidence to bring their own. A murder, one would expect quite rightly, to be a criminal case, but Mrs Siddons has tried to persuade the police to prosecute. She's tried to persuade the Department of Public Prosecutions to prosecute, and they simply won't do it. Now, of course, theoretically, she could bring a private prosecution, but the state of the system really just prevents her from doing that. A private prosecution would be fantastically expensive, and anyone wanting to bring a private prosecution has to be very, very wealthy, and Mrs. Siddons isn't wealthy. Secondly, of course, if she did bring a private prosecution, it would be open to the DPP to take it over and to do with that prosecution what they wanted, and it's quite clear that what they would do is to take it over and stop it. The Director of Public Prosecutions was stuck with the notion that you had to have at least a 51% chance of securing a conviction before he went into court. And with all these conflicting stories and the time that had elapsed and the problems that, you know, really, that uh, many in the local police didn't believe that they got it wrong the first time, there wasn't a sufficient collection of evidence to do that. Not at that point. Well into her 70s, Flo Siddons continued to work to fund her campaign. She'd run up thousands of pounds in legal bills. Nine years after Lynn's death, she finally got a break. The Law Society looked into her case and agreed to help pay for court action. Not for murder, but for damages. Well, I'm feeling um, relieved, really. Getting a load off of mine because I wouldn't know how to win it other way without, you know, without winning legal aid. The next battle the family faced was to persuade the authorities to allow the action to go ahead, outside the normal time limit. That meant travelling to hearings all over the country. It took a further four years. You're living with it every day. I know you, it's all come to a head now, but, I mean, over the years, you just can't get on with your lives. You've, we've got to see this through to the end now, no matter what happens. I'm determined, I am. I mean, if I set out to do anything, I want to do it. And I won't stop till I've got to the end of it. As long as I'm around when it happens, that's what bothers me. What came next was an improving of relations with Derbyshire police. It coincided with the arrival of a new chief constable and a firm date for the damages action. 
John Newing had come from the Metropolitan Police. After studying the file, he assured Mrs. Siddons the case was not closed, and after years of official silence, said so to the BBC. We know that, uh, in essence, mm. we can't really take any further action until, no, no. Uh, until the case is decided one way or the other. I want to make sure that uh, we finally uh, get the matter properly resolved. Um, th and then that is, a, I mean, that's an objective, not just that I've got, but that a lot of my officers have got. They would like to see this case closed. And there's only one way to close a murder case. Before that, there was history to be made. The damages action in London was the first for a murder of which no one had been convicted. News organisations lined up for pictures of Flo, Gail and Cynthia. And when Roy Brooks arrived to give evidence, he found himself surrounded. 13 years after he stood trial in a case that attracted little attention outside Derby. His legal advisers shielded him from publicity, but couldn't prevent him from being made to appear on the orders of appeal court judges. He repeated in chilling detail what he'd said at his trial, that Michael Brooks had forced him to lure Lynn to her death because of the older man's desire to kill like Jack the Ripper. Mr Justice Rougier asked why he'd not warned Lynn. Roy Brooks said he'd not taken the threat seriously, then was frightened. Michael Brooks, the target of the court action, never came to court. He stayed in the quiet of East Anglia. But even in his absence, his personality and his alleged sexual habits dominated proceedings. It was said he got pleasure from using knives, that he'd stabbed pictures of nude women, that he'd talked of getting girls, and had threatened to harm his wife if the attack on Lynn Siddons hadn't succeeded. His barrister chose not to call him to defend himself against the allegations, arguing there was no direct physical evidence to link Mr Brooks with the murder. The judge, sitting without a jury, said he would draw his own conclusions from the defendant's failure to appear. He concluded that Michael Brooks had been 100% responsible for the crime, and at the time of the murder, he emotionally dominated his stepson. That domination was so complete that Roy would obey his commands without question. Lynn's family had been saying that since the spring of 1978. Suddenly, in 1991, it seemed everyone wanted to listen. Can you tell us how you feel, please? You Very happy. Me. Well, we just want to say um, that we're hoping for a criminal trial now. And we wouldn't have had to do all this in the first place if the police had done the job properly. It has been worthwhile anyway. We've got to it eventually with a, all, a lot of hard work, but I'm pleased. What do you think of the way the judge summed the whole case up? I think it was very good, I do. Yeah. He seemed really to understand. I you... think he did, yes. I'm glad somebody understood, though. It's... <laughs> but we've got, we've got a lot of people to thank for all this lot. And so what happens now, then? Well, I'm hoping they'll have a conviction. Do you want to see Michael Brooks put away in prison for a long time? Yes, a very long while. Yes. What are your thoughts towards him? Oh, what do you... That's all I hate him. Don't <coughs> put him I'd never like anybody who did anything like that for a girl. Or anybody. It must be asked why it was for 13 years the police had abandoned this murder investigation. And why it was for 13 years the police failed to dig up evidence that these two women, with no resources dug up, it must be asked why these two women managed to piece together the evidence that they dug up to build a case against Michael Brooks and why it was that the police took no notice of that evidence. Why was it that the Department of Public Prosecutions refused to prosecute even when these two women had dug the evidence up, pieced it together and built a case? Questions must be answered. Why wasn't Michael Brooks prosecuted at the time? I'm afraid that's not something you can ask me. With the benefit of hindsight, I can say that probably he should have been, uh, but he wasn't. Um, it's really not going to achieve any sensible purpose in going over, if you like, old history. Um, but the fact of the matter is that when you look at it 13 years on, yes, he should have been on the charge sheet along with, uh, with his stepson.
Are you saying basically that Derbyshire Police made a, a mess of the case? You use emotive language, don't you? And I suppose that's inevitable. It's simpler to put it. But bluntly, yes, I suppose uh, that is, when you look back, that is the end result. Certainly that's how Flo Siddons sees it. And you agree with her? Yes. It was a very difficult investigation. All sorts of problems sprung up from time to time. And we dealt them the best way we knew how at the time. And. Uh, I think if it all happened again, we'd probably do exactly the same thing. It's been very difficult. I feel very sorry for the, the victims' um, relatives, and I can understand their feelings, but we did our best. What we have to recognise is when mistakes are made, uh, they have to be admitted. But that does not mean that the people responsible for those mistakes are bad people, nor that they are unprofessional. It means they have made mistakes. When you look at their record through a career, a lifetime of policing, their record has been extremely good indeed. On this occasion, it wasn't up to the normal professional standards that you would associate with a murder investigation or any other criminal investigation for that matter. In Peterborough, Michael Brooks remained indoors visiting reporters became the target of his wife's frustration. Upstairs, Michael Brooks denounced the Siddonses and his stepson. Would you say to us, in your own words, that you did not kill Lynn Siddons, which is what you're saying, isn't it? Then he accused the Siddonses of threatening him. You'll ask them about the plan to murder me and my daughter. Go on, ask them. Lynn's aunt Cynthia called that a load of rubbish. Michael Brooks' lawyer said he'd be appealing against the judgment. The past years and the events of yesterday and today have placed the most enormous strain on my client and his family. He is not going to be interviewed at this juncture. If he were, he would repeat his denials of his responsibility for this dreadful murder. Although I appreciate that such denials would be like spitting in the wind in view of the long-standing campaign of public vilification against him. The High Court has ordered Michael Brooks to pay damages, the most the law will allow, £10,641. I think it's sickening when you see the amount, what they offer. Compared with what? Uh, libel cases and things like that. I says they got hundreds of thousands for calling somebody boring or frivolous, and somebody being murdered to get nearly eleven thousand. I think it's disgusting. It's about time the law was changed. I want to see him caught for what he did at Lynn. I'll feel happy then when we've got him to court, and I'll never rest till we do get him. I think that Flo Siddons is one of the most remarkable women I've known. I met her first under the shadow of enormous tragedy. She brought Lynn up and her murder and the horrific circumstances of it would have shaken any family. And they devastated um, Mrs. Siddons and her daughters, Gail and Cynthia and the rest of her family. I think they were all deeply shaken by it. But to see that woman over the next 12 years enter her own old age fighting for a cause, educating herself in the ways of the law, buttonholing journalists, appealing to MPs, going endlessly down to London, and simply doggedly saying one thing, the murder of Lynn Siddons is still walking the streets a free man. The law should not allow that. He has to be brought to justice. And eventually people listened.